from the beautiful Missouri Ozarks. Greetings and welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship Old Testament Bible Study for Sunday, July 25th, 2021. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. I saw you cheat and look at that, that thing on your MacBook. I already knew. What I knew the it? date. Is it? What day is it? What <laughs> month is it? What year is it? Seriously. How are we almost at August? Uh, it, it's clearly a time warp. It really, you know, those of you who have deadlines for certain things, you're looking at your calendar. For instance, you're mm-hmm. thinking school starts yeah, in yeah. August uh-huh. and you're shocked. Where did the summer go? Where did go? the summer go? Yeah. Or if you have to, if something else is starting in August or September, you're thinking, what? Well, Christmas stuff is in the stores. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What? Yeah, it's, uh, I, I am convinced, a truism that time really does move faster the older you get. It really does, yeah. especially it if you've got a manuscript due. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. To his credit, Tom hasn't been writing and saying, are you guys done with that yet? <laughs> yeah. No, thankfully, we've actually... Uh, this year, I've worked ahead at the Defender Publishing Skywatch TV schedule is now actually getting further out. So there's there's a little more leeway to allow for things like mysterious paper shortages at the printing company. Yeah. <laughs> so that the uh, ladies in the store are not uh, deluged with people saying, where's my book? Well, so, your new book is now available for pre-order at Amazon. It is, but uh, do, yeah, I know. You know, do, do be aware that it is not scheduled for release until November 15th. So. And that is because we're assuming there's a paper shortage and right. uh, we'll be told by the printer, yeah. eh, we'd love to get that to you, but we can't. Yeah, but uh, that's only four months out. So really, it's not very long. for a turnaround on a book, that's actually not, no. that, uh, no. not that bad. No. Uh, a lot of books... Uh, at large publishing houses will be out a year and a half or more mm-hmm. from the time they turned in because they, they can't let their schedules be um, disrupted by unexpected things. Defender, a little smaller and thus more nimble in terms of scheduling and whatnot. Well, that's so. just it. A, a lot of distribution companies want all of the information a year in advance. Yeah, yeah. They And Balker wants all of the information, which is the sort of clearinghouse for mm-hmm book titles and and information about them so your local bookstore can order through them. Um, They want it far in advance, too. You know, we sort of don't do that generally. And I think it's great because it allows this small publishing house Mm -hmm. to be more nimble. And when something pops up that suddenly is top of mind in the news, like the... um well, the, the, the last disclosure. year and a half. Yeah, or COVID, right. Mm-hmm. That uh, suddenly Defender can come yes, out with a book. and disclosure, yes. Right. There is a documentary and a book coming out about mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. That will be, uh, in fact, we've even floated the idea of a revised and updated edition of um, the, uh, the Day the Earth Stands Still, the book mm-hmm. that Josh and I wrote. But uh, I, I, don't, I don't know that that's going to happen. But if you uh, haven't read but, it, you uh, should. Yeah, Tom is, I've noticed, Tom Horn curates all the news at the Skywatch TV website. And by the way, if you don't have the Skywatch TV mobile app, you really should, because not only do you get all of the video content, but the news that gets posted to the website goes straight to the uh, uh, the mobile app. And, and honestly, the interface on the mobile app for the news is really, really it convenient, really easy is. to navigate. Oh, it's so good. And you get to watch the videos without third-party ads. Yeah. Uh, Skywatch TV, if you haven't heard, got kicked off YouTube about six weeks ago now. Uh, without any warning, without any warning that we had, we had, um, you and I had earned the channel a strike mm-hmm. <laughs> because they took us exception to something we said on Sci Friday, which wasn't what we said, but in, no, no, in they the took mind of YouTube, one word and, yeah. and took it out of context. Yeah. If they'd actually watched the program, they would right. have realized we were saying the opposite. Yeah. But it doesn't matter to them. Yeah. They, they don't really care. Uh, so that uh, was strike one, and then suddenly strikes two and three came within an hour of one another. One morning, we woke up and people were saying, hey, where'd you go? And it was because Josh, uh, a program, the broadcast show about Doc's, Josh Peck's documentary on child trafficking had triggered somebody at uh, YouTube. And they said that uh, upon reviewing the channel, they found repeated instances of harassment, threats, and cyberbullying. And so they just deleted the whole channel. In other words, the bottom line is they didn't like what They didn't like said. the message, right. No. Yeah. So That's okay. They so, didn't like Jesus's message either. That's true. So Not we, that we're equating ourselves no, to no. that, but we're trying very hard to lift him up. We, we shouldn't be surprised when the world comes against us because they killed him. Yeah. So... They deleted the channel. Um, all of Skywatch TV's new content now 
are over at uh, is over at uh, uh, Rumble Rumble dot com slash Skywatch TV if you want the new videos. But really, the easiest way to get the, the content because Rumble does monetize the videos, mm-hmm. which you can't blame them for that because they're hosting the video content for free. If we were paying to host it, Rumble it would cost us. So, all right. But if you have the mobile app or if you watch us on Roku or Apple TV, those videos come from a company called Subsplash. They host it for us. We do pay them, and that's a Christian company. They're not going to censor us, and they don't run ads in front of our uh, video content, exactly. Skywatch TV video content. So. I would highly recommend using the mobile app or watching on Roku or Apple TV because you are supporting that Christian company. Yeah. You know, we are delighted with the way they have responded to us and taken care of us. Right. They, they are not, you know, gouging us for money. So yeah, Subsplash has been wonderful to work with. Their customer support has really, really helped Skywatch TV in launching you know, the the Roku and Apple TV channel, it, it, they have taken so much work off of our plates in, oh. in being able to do that compared to what we were doing when we first had to launch and basically <laughs> set up our own Roku interface. Oh, yeah. Oh, I do remember so. you're doing that. That was uh, that was complicated. But the other, you know, sort of uh, plug I want to make is that the virtual conference that is still available. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it runs through September 18th. OK. Thank you. Um, So you can still register and watch it. It's just that the number of days you have left to watch all the content goes down with every day that passes between now and then. But that is available at... Uscreen.tv. Well, it's actually the easiest way to get there is DefenderConference.com. Yeah. Because the... the, uh the URL is a little longer. It's, it is. Yeah, Just go to they, Defender and there will be a button to click and you can. Right. it'll take you there. But they've been really good and responsive yes, as well. Yes. And they, they helped out uh, friends of ours who got in tough situations, similar situations where another hosting company just kicked them off yeah. in, the middle, in the middle of virtual conferences. Can you imagine that? A couple thousand subscribers and suddenly virtual conference just bleep. It's not there anymore. <laughs> I got to hear the Watchmen conference kicked offline. <laughs> My presentation you know, i was uh, yes okay well i tell you what you and i whew. yeah we're well you know we're pretty radical i guess so but this company <laughs> so helped not. bail them out and uh uh prophecy watchers similar situations and they're the ones who recommended you screen is the company that we're using for the virtual conference for skywatch tv and that was really a help too so and their customer service has been awesome because there have been some technical things that I couldn't figure out. And at 8 o'clock at night, I sent an email thinking, okay, I'll get a response tomorrow morning. No, I got a response in 10 minutes at 8 p.m. Very, very amazing. Yeah. Um, and I then, don't know if they're a Christian company or not, but they are certainly being kind and responsive right. with us. So as we try to navigate this this new woke reality in which we're all, uh, we find ourselves here, we suddenly wake up in 2021 and find the world sort of like turn, ar- t- turn around. It's like 2012, 2021, those two numbers, tw- 12 and 21 reversed. The whole world is reversed. It, it seems. really is. I agree. It really has. Yeah. But it, it's a reminder of our commission. Mm-hmm. We are to preach the gospel. Right, right. And We're not to win a debate. Yeah, and that's that's a hard thing for me to keep remembering um, because that's uh, the way I'm wired. But Jesus told the disciples, don't uh, if you go to a town and you preach and they won't hear your message, just shake the dust from that town from your sandals as a reproach and then move on. No, hashtag them to death. Yeah. Bludgeon them into submission with your superior logic. No, that doesn't usually work. Um and the other thing, too, and I was thinking about this as uh, I was driving back from St. Louis yesterday, we spent a couple of days visiting our daughter in St. Louis, watching the Cubs lose to the Cardinals, but that's OK. Um, the political situation as I was listening to political talk radio on the way home and hearing one radio program where they were using scripture to, to try to justify taking back America I'm like. But that's not really our commission. No. I mean, I understand the sentiment and it's it's very, you know, because I found myself politically agreeing with what everything the guy was saying. But when you compare that with what we read of the apostles in the New Testament, starting with, the, you know, the book of Acts and the and the the Pauline epistles and so forth. But even Jesus Great Commission, it wasn't go forth and form political action committees. It was preach the gospel, make the, making disciples of all nations. And, and and that means of all people groups, yes, not yes. countries, not countries, right? 
of all ethnos, of all ethnic groups. Bottom line, the reason he said that is because, look, we're no longer Jews only. Yes. Jesus I, came, Jesus, exactly. He came to preach to the Jews first, to the lost sheep of Israel. But then the mission that he left the apostles was to go to all people. And that's our mission. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we, we are to be good citizens, which means voting, getting involved in local politics where we still have a degree of control over our lives. But uh, we're not going to vote Jesus into the White House or put Jesus on the Supreme Court. We're not going to save anybody by doing that. Because we are citizens of a kingdom. Yeah. That is our primary citizenship. Yeah. We, we've been been looped into a belief system where we're trying to impose a top-down solution. Mm-hmm. If we simply get the right president so we, appo- we, we appoint the right Supreme Court justices, we can impose Christian morality on people who still aren't saved but are forced to live according to our standard of morality. Well, that's, that's what not- the disciples wanted in the first century. Yeah. Jesus, okay. take over and kick them all out. Exactly. And, he's, and, he, and he corrected them. That's not what we're called to do. If we change hearts one at a time through personal witnessing, testimony, and making disciples— which means sometimes loving people who aren't very lovable, they won't want to take advantage of the laws that allow them to do whatever Mm -hmm. because they'll understand, oh, this is not the way we're supposed to live. Rather than imposing the laws on them that prevent them from doing the stuff they want to do, if their hearts aren't changed, they're still lost. They might be living according to rules that don't allow, for example, the termination of unborn children, which would be a good thing. I, I think there should be a law against that. But if people still want to do it, if their hearts are unchanged and unregenerate, they're still going to wind up in hell. That's the point of the Old Testament. The law reveals mankind's right. sin. The shadow of the substance which is to come, which mm-hmm. is Christ. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so well, bottom line is that there's a lot of stuff going on that really will distract you from your mission. Mm-hmm. So... Stay on point. Yeah. And I'm like the, uh, I'm like the dog driving the truck in that commercial. Squirrel. Oh, <laughs> oh my. Uh, well, let's well, we're still in numbers, but we're going to pray first. Yeah. Getting close to the end of numbers. Father, thank you for bringing us together over your word. We just pray for your spirit to grant us wisdom and discernment to know which battles we should fight, Father, and how we should fight. Because we, we think of this word fight and, and the fact that we are called to be Christian soldiers in a sense, but that does not mean being contentious with the world necessarily because not everyone will respond to that message. There are people who are hurting and broken and who don't understand that it's because of the principalities and powers at work in this world. They blame you or they blame the church. Many have been hurt by those wolves in sheep's clothing who have embedded themselves inside the church. And they blame you for their actions. Help us, Lord, to be loving and understanding and forgiving as you were, Father, even unto the cross where you forgave those who put you there because they didn't know what they were doing. Help us, Lord, to love the unlovable and to understand that the the anger of the world directed at us is not really inspired by us, but by you. It is directed at you. We are just in between you and them. Help us not to make ourselves stumbling blocks, but to facilitate, to show them the way, to smooth the path for them between you and the gospel by speaking the truth with love, by showing love. Grant us this wisdom, Father and the right spirit and help us Lord as we read your word today to understand it to the best of our ability we pray in Jesus name amen 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 you know you mentioned um, that we're soldiers and we are but Ephesians 6 doesn't imply that we're soldiers in the material world right right all of that armor and our one weapon the sword the word of the God Mm -hmm. that the word of the Lord that's all for a spiritual warfare. Yes, yes. And the fact that Paul uses the word stand, 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 and withstand during that section, Ephesians 6, 10 mm-hmm. through 20, 
it, we're, we're fighting a defensive action. We're holding ground. We're not going forth to conquer. We are. And he will do that when he returns. All of the stuff we were talking about earlier, yeah. the whole thing of uh, social media and all that, this carrier and that carrier. That's all part of the spiritual war. And, and the people involved, the humans involved in it are just being, a, you know, they're being puppets in some cases. Yeah. The, the true enemy is a spiritual enemy. Just tr- remember mm-hmm. that. I think we're we're <laughs> we could do this for an hour for that uh, forthcoming Revelation Insight and Spiritual Warfare weekend in Sparta. You know I, I we think. could we could and that's coming up. Yeah. Um, we'll tell you more about that Just at the very end weeks. when we right. talk about various things, including a super secret uh, announcement that's coming out from Skywatch TV. <gasps> we so can't secret. I don't even. Remember what you it is. do know what it is. Oh, okay. It's something Tom just sent us an email about, and he said, "I want you to prepare oh, for." Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Yes. So big announcement coming That's soon from super Scarlet. Se- yeah. yeah. Finger to the side of the oh, nose. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That one. Yeah. So we. Uh, We're always up to something. Numbers thirty-three. We uh, actually didn't finish the entire chapter. I got tired of reading. <laughs> well, you had all the ne- you had all the place names, all the unpronounceable place names. Well, plus we had some stuff to talk about sure. at the end of that song. But uh, yes, we left Moses and uh, kind of recounting the history of the Israelites. When we left, Les. In the mountains of Avarim, the mountains of the travelers before Nebo. Um, By the way, yes? speaking of the, the, the mountain of the travelers, mm-hmm. you know how we've discussed before the dolmens mm-hmm. that are in that region? Yes. Do you know... That dolmens have been discovered on some Japanese islands. I'm not surprised because there are a lot of them in Korea. Well, so. here's the thing: there, the assumption is that <clears throat> that style of, I'll say the word burial, because some of those dolmens contain remains, mm-hmm. which is unusual. But uh, the assumption is that it all came from south, from Korea, mm. before it was north and south, but it mm-hmm. came from Korea. However, the island in between the areas where you find them mm-hmm. doesn't have any. It's like it skipped an island. Hmm. Interesting. Isn't that odd? Huh. Yeah. So what's the deal there? Yeah. Yeah. Dolmens are fascinating. They're all over the place. I know. So anyway, that's what's going on yeah. in the Valley of the Travelers. It's essentially a whole bunch of, I maintain their portals. I think you're correct. Oh, yeah. Or you're rep- finally coming around in my way of thinking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we're beginning at Numbers chapter 33, verse 50. And Yahweh spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you pass over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land before you and destroy all their figured stones. Ah, men hears? Yes. Well, but, this says molten images. Figured stones and destroy all their metal images oh, and okay. demolish all their high places. All right. This is this is what this says. And you, this is the Septuagint, the print mm-hmm. on the 19th century translation. And you shall abolish their high places and all their molten images you shall destroy and you shall demolish all their pillars. Yes. Which probably you're right. Probably are the menhirs. Menhirs or commemorative stones, mm-hmm. stelas that... Uh, I don't know if we so talked about so those before. So-and-so passed through and did this. Well, no, no. Um, uh, th- those were the stelas that were erected like uh, the, the uh, Kunamua stela, which is found at, um, uh, it's in southern Turkey. It's near the, the ancient city of Antioch, Antakya now, mm-hmm. uh, the kingdom of um, Palestine, actually, or Wallistan, depending yeah. on how it was transliterated. But yes, it is related to Philistine and Palestine. Mm-hmm. Same group of people came from the Aegean, probably of Greek origin. The mm-hmm. Philistines were probably Greek originally. They um, commemorated a fellow who died and, you know, said, uh, when you, you know, slaughter this and offer this uh, to, to Baal and offer this for me. And if you move this stone, you'll be cursed. And oh, uh, essentially, yeah. it's the same kind of stone that Absalom was recorded as setting up in the valley of yes. uh, in uh, the, the Kidron and because he didn't like, have a son to remember his name. Yes, sort of like an obelisk. Too. Yes, yes. It was it was to keep people saying his name so that he wouldn't be forgotten in the afterlife and then starve. <laughs> eating dust and clay for all eternity. You had to summon them and remember them to keep them alive. Can that you was imagine the really believing in the Old that? Testament. But that's what they did. They really they did. believed that. You right. grew up in that environment and that's all you knew. Yeah. So that was probably one of the uh, uh, 
reference there to the figured stones or carved stones. Uh, Verse 53, and you shall take possession of the land and settle in it, for I have given the land to you to possess it. You shall inherit the land by lot according to your clans. Can you read 53 again? And you shall take possession of the land and settle in it, for I have given the land to you to possess it. This says, and you shall destroy all the inhabitants of the land. That That's that's different. Mm-hmm. And of course, that is what Joshua is told to do. Yeah. There are um, certain cities where he's told to destroy everything and everybody. The New English translation, uh, inher- uh, take possession of the land... They translate it, you must dispossess the inhabitants of the land. Mm -hmm. Kick them out, but this says destroy. Yeah. You shall inherit the land by lot according to your clans. To a large tribe you shall give a large inheritance, and to a small tribe you shall give a small inheritance. Wherever the lot falls for anyone, that shall be his. According to the tribes of your fathers you shall inherit. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then those of them who you let remain shall be as barbs in your eyes ouch, and thorns in your sides, and they shall trouble you in the land where you dwell. And I will do to you as I thought to do to them. Now, and sure enough, that does happen. Yeah. Skeptics will say, well, God was, this was invented by the Israelites to create a backstory and justify them taking the land away from the uh, the Canaanites. Yeah. But when you read Leviticus, as we did, it's like God said he was driving them out because they were doing all these despicable things. Mm-hmm. You know, th- and those- when, you, when you think about this in terms of spiritual warfare, when Yahweh decided, I'm going to take this man, Abraham, and I'm going to create my own tribe, and that will be the tribe that I use to bring forth my Messiah. Mm-hmm. Then lots of things happened to try to, you know, uncouple Abraham from this new belief and return him to the old belief. He went through a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then eventually you get the whole movement to Egypt and they're put through a lot of stuff there. So the Lord signaled to the fallen realm right there in Egypt as they were fleeing, I'm coming for you. Mm -hmm. And they all prepared the people in advance. They did. Um, Yeah, and you're right, going back as early as Abraham with the Mm -hmm. testing, the binding of Isaac on Mm -hmm. Mount Moriah, which became the place where the temple is located now. Interestingly, and I'd forgotten this, but when I was writing the section of the book on the ancient Hurrian god Kumarbi, who is equated with El of the Canaanites, Kronos of the Greeks, Saturn of the Romans, and... I I stumbled across something in Abraham's life that I'd I'd missed. I, I wrote... In the book, my argument as to why Abraham, I believe, I think the evidence in the in the Bible and outside the Bible shows that Abraham came from northern Mesopotamia, that region where Syria, Turkey, and Iraq all come together, mm-hmm. rather than uh, Ur uh, in southeast Iraq. He was not Sumerian. He was uh, he came from the Amorite culture, but that land up there around ancient Haran, uh, it's near the modern city of San Lirfa in in Turkey was an area that was occupied mainly by the Hurrians and their chief god, their creator god, was Kumarbi. Abraham, when he sent his servant, possibly Eleazar, back to find a wife for Isaac, he said, you must not take my son back there. So he was making it clear, don't send him back there among the relatives because he will be drawn back into the worship of this God who you have to dig a a, a ritual pit to summon from the netherworld. And that's exactly what happened with Jacob. Yeah. When he got back there, you know, they tried to pull Laban him was like, oh, yeah. stick around, you know, for <laughs> like a while. Like Michael Corleone, they pulled me back in. Whoa. <laughs> Sorry well, about that. Didn't mean to shout. Peg, yeah, shout and peg the needles there. Oh, uh, you, you just so forth. Yeah. Well, we'll go on to uh, chapter 34. We'll to, make it to another. Hmm? You want me to continue no, reading I'm, or I'm going to continue. Oh, okay. I'm going to read. Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, command the people of Israel and say to them, When you enter into the land of Canaan, this is the land that shall fall to you for an inheritance. The land of Canaan, as defined by its borders, that was in parentheses, by Mm -hmm. the way. It's in the text, not my parentheses. It's in the text, which is interesting that the translators chose to put that in parentheses, like, God, it's an aside (laughs) to the audience. Mm -hmm. Your south side shall be from the wilderness of Zin. Mm Mm-hmm. Is this scene? 
Yeah, I think it's the same thing. I yeah. think just transliterated differently. Alongside Yadam, that would be the wilderness of Sin, and your southern, which tells you the fact that it, that's alongside Yadam. That gives you a big clue as yeah. to where the wilderness of Sin is. Mm-hmm. And your southern... You know, and I think that's why you've got these uh, two different transliterations, the wilderness of sin or seen and the wilderness of zin, um, because the clue here is that th- this is not in what we think of today as Arabia, although right. Arabia back in the day was a much bigger area. Yeah. They, so they, they, they translated it and transliterate it differently so they can justify saying, okay, well... Yeah, Mount Sinai, that's in the Sinai Peninsula, way down south there, the traditional location found by Helena, mother of Constantine. Did you just put on a conspiracy hat? (laughs) You spotted that. So I I think this is a way of rationalizing this putting the wilderness next to Edom, close to the Dead Sea. You have scholars who who contribute to these translations, and some of them have have written books, and they are standing upon a particular idea. I get that. And those ideas, they're they're not new. It it goes way, way back for centuries. And and the thing is, we're not going to resolve it here uh, during our study, even if we spent weeks and weeks and weeks on this, because this is something that our scholars have been arguing over for thousands of Mm -hmm. years. Yeah. Yeah. So, verse 3 again, your south side shall be from the wilderness of Sin alongside Edom, and your southern border shall run from the end of the Salt Sea on the east. And your border, we'll need a map here. Yeah, there, there will be one in the notes at gilberthouse.org. In your, fact, there was a, there was a, uh, I put a, a tribal distribution map in last week's study, but mm-hmm. I think I'm going to have to find a different one here because I, I see that some of these locations are not quite quite where yeah. they were in last week's map so you could draw your own oh <laughs> Ooh, that was a nice little grumble <laughs> that would take and your border shall turn south of the ascent of agravim where is that that is a pass between the the pass through the the uh Shara Mountains, the mountains of Seir, which are the mountains along the east side of the Arava Valley that connects the Dead Sea and the Red Sea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was a battle that was fought there by one of the kings of Judah. Hmm. The uh, Septuagint, by the way, does say the wilderness of Sin. Ah. Just checking on that. So, meanwhile, back to the ESV. Um, and your border shall turn south of the ascent of Akravim. Oh. And Cross to Sin. Hmm? Akravim, uh, apparently in Hebrew, means uh, scorpion. Oh, that's interesting. And cross to Sin, and its limit shall be south of Kadesh Barnea. Which we believe is not where most scholars put it. Well, most the scholars put it map puts it down by Petra. Yeah, and that, that's, that makes more sense than yeah. uh, the, the location that scholars have been sort of Agreeing on for the last century, which is in the northern Sinai. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then it shall pass, and then it shall go on to Hatsaradar and pass along to Atzmon. Where is Atzmon? Um, don't know. Modern day something? <laughs> I'm oh, sure. Oh, this is- says, uh, oh, Ashmona. Isn't there an Ashmona um, in the Septuagint? don't know it sounds familiar anyway um and so the border verse five and so the border shall turn from its moan to the brook of egypt and its limit shall be at the sea yeah the brook of egypt is a, a wadi uh that that uh, the wadi al arish which is the easternmost branch of the nile and uh, it is the traditional boundary between uh israel and egypt not quite modern day Israel, is it? No, it isn't. Uh-uh. Not even the nineteen, you know, post sixty seven borders. <laughs> it's a little bit bigger than that. A little yeah. bit bigger than that. For the western border, you shall have the Great Sea, and its coast. That's the Mediterranean. I figured yep, that, yep. but important to know. This shall be your western border. This shall be your northern border. From the Great Sea, you shall draw a line to Mount Hor. That, again, is in the vicinity of Petra. But this says your northern border. Mm-hmm. 
that can't be the northern. Oh, okay, border. right, 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 right. There, there is a northern Mount Hoare, correct? Yes, you're right. Not, not the same Mount Hoare. I was going to say, don't. Yeah, there, don't there go is there. one in the north, right? Let's see what verse. Is in it? Verse seven. No, I'm looking at the Septuagint. Septuagint verse seven, and this shall be your northern border from the great sea. You shall measure to your, measure to yourselves by the side of the mountain, and you shall measure to yourselves the mountain from Mount Hor at the entering into Emoth, and the termination of it shall be the coasts of Saradak. Yeah. And verse 7 in the ESV, again, this shall be your northern border from the great sea. You shall draw a line to Mount Hor. From Mount Hor, you shall draw a line to Levo Hamat, and the limit of the border shall be at Sedad. Lebo Hamath is 50 miles north of Damascus. That's, whoa. Yeah. Hmm. Well, you know, in the millennial age, the scriptures talk about a a road going all the way from Egypt to Assyria, Damascus to to Syria, to Assyria. Yes, yes, it would have been Assyria, but it would have time. gone through Damascus because the road. Yeah, that's that, my point. It goes at least to Damascus, right through Damascus through Palmyra, mm-hmm. um, Tadmor back in the day. So the Lord's taking the, the He's going to establish these borders. Yeah, yeah. Levo Hamath was uh, was way farther north than is shown on the map that I. Put last week, which is why I'm saying I've got to find another map that uh, actually goes that far north. Don't you and have I, a plugin you can use or an app or something? <laughs> yeah, there must be. Someone must There's have an some, app somewhere. Yes. Verse 9, then the border shall extend at Zifron and its limit shall be at Hatzar, 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 Hatzar Enon. This shall be your northern border. Don't know where those locations are, but again, well inside modern day Syria. Very much so. Verse 10, you shall draw a line from your eastern border, for your eastern border, from Hatsaranan to Shefam. And the border shall go down from Shefam to Ribla on the east side of Ain. Again, don't, don't know where the, any of those locations are. And the border shall go down and reach to the shoulder of the Sea of Kinnereth okay. on the east. So all of those locations then, if they're, if they're following, uh, basically drawing an outline, mm-hmm. those would all be north and east. Those last couple locations probably are uh, in the Golan Heights. Oh, yes, definitely. Um, sea of Kinnereth, by the way, is Galilee. Yes. And the border shall go down to the Jordan, and its limit shall be at the Salt Sea. This shall be your land as defined by its borders all around. Interestingly, though, they gave, um, yeah, the shoulder of the Sea of Kinnereth on the east, the territory of the half tribe of Manasseh, of Gad, and uh, and the full tribes of Gad and Reuben were east of that. Yes. They Isn't were in that the, interesting? They were in the areas not allotted by God, according to this definition. Isn't that odd? That is odd, isn't it? Yeah, we're going to have to take a look at this map again. Verse 13, Moses commanded the people of Israel, saying, This is the land that you shall inherit by lot, which Yahweh has commanded to give you to, to give to the nine tribes and to the half tribe. For the tribe of the people of Reuben by fathers' houses and the tribe of the people of Gad by their fathers' houses have received their inheritance and also the half-tribe of Manasseh. The two tribes and the half-tribe have received their Ah. inheritance beyond the Jordan, east of Jericho, towards the sunrise. So it's including that. Yeah. But this is what he's describing is the area that's going to be given by lots. Okay. The area. Right. Okay. The area given to the other tribes. So, all right. So, yeah, he's not leaving them out. Sorry, we don't like you anymore. Get over there. (laughs) Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, These are the names of the men who shall divide the land to you for inheritance. Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun. In other words, these are the two guys who are in charge once you're gone. You shall take one chief from every tribe to divide the land for inheritance. These are the names of the men, of the men of the tribe of Judah. Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. Of the tribe of the uh, the people of Simeon, Shemuel, the son of Amahud, of the tribe of, you see, I get all the, the names again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of the tribe of Benjamin, Elidad, the son of Kishlon, of the tribe of the people of Dan, a chief, Buki, the son of Yogli, 
of the people of of Joseph or Yosef, of the tribe of the people of Manasseh, a chief Haniel, the son of Ephod, and of the tribe of the people of Ephraim, a chief Kemuel, the son of Shiftan, of the people of the of the tribe of the people of Zebulun, a chief Elitzaphan, the son of Parnach, of the tribe of the people of Issachar, a chief Paltiel, the son of Atzan. Of the tribe of the people of Asher, a chief, Ahihud, Ahihud hmm. the son of Shalomi. Of the tribe of the people of Naphtali, a chief, Pedachel, the son of Amihud. These are the men whom Yahweh commanded to divide the inheritance for the people of Israel in the land of Canaan. It's interesting that even though all of these allotments were drawn by a lot, mm-hmm. which you wonder if that's the etymology of the word allotment. I've allotted this to you because mm, mm-hmm. we drew by lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and the very fact that you sit on a lot, mm-hmm. my house is on a lot that's a quarter of an acre or whatever, um, you still get Benjamin and Judah right there in Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. Where they're supposed to be. Where they're supposed to be, right? Yes. So in other words, none of this is by random chance. No. It will appear so to the tribes, but Yahweh is still in control of it all. Mm Mm-hmm. Numbers chapter 35. Yahweh spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho, saying, Command the people of Israel to give to the Levites some of the inheritance of their possession as cities for them to dwell in. And you shall give to the Levites pasture lands around the cities. The cities shall be theirs to dwell in. And their pasture lands shall be for their cattle and for their livestock and for all their beasts. The pasture lands of the cities, which you shall give to the Levites, shall reach from the wall of the city outward a thousand cubits all around. And you shall measure outside the city on the east side 2,000 cubits, on the south side 2,000 cubits, and on the west side 2,000 cubits, and on the north side 2,000 cubits, the city being in the middle. This shall belong to them as pasture land for their cities. The Septuagint doesn't say pasture land. I love it. It says suburbs. (laughs) Interesting. The cities that you shall give to the Levites shall be the six cities of refuge, where you shall permit, permit the manslayer to flee. And in addition to them, you shall give 42 cities. All the cities that you shall give, uh, that you give to the Levites shall be 48 with their pasture lands. And as for the cities that you shall give them, that you shall give from the possession of the people of Israel, from the larger tribes, you shall take many. And from the smaller tribes, you shall take few. Each in proportion to the inheritance that it inherits shall give of its cities to the Levites. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall select cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the manslayer who kills any person without intent may flee there. You know, going back to this thing of if you're a small tribe, you get a small, you know, portion. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not very politically correct. They're in the minority. Shouldn't they get more? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. The Lord sees the world a little differently than yeah, we do. Yeah. Verse 12. The cities shall be for you a refuge from the avenger, that the manslayer may not die until he stands before the congregation for judgment. And the cities that you give shall be your city, six cities of refuge. You shall give three cities beyond the Jordan and three cities in the land of Canaan to be cities of refuge. These six cities shall be for refuge for the people of Israel and for the stranger and for the sojourner among them, that anyone who kills any person without intent may flee there. But if he struck him down with an iron object so that he died, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. And if he struck him down with a stone tool that could cause death and he died, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. Or if he struck him down with a wooden tool that could cause death and he died, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. The avenger of blood shall shall himself put the murderer to death. When he meets him, he shall put him to death. And if he pushed him out of hatred or hurled something at him, lying in wait so that he died, or in enmity struck him down with his hand so that he died, then he who struck the blow shall be put to death. He is a murderer. The avenger of blood shall put the murderer to death when he meets him. 
But if he pushed him suddenly without enmity, or hurled anything on him without lying in wait, or used a stone that could cause death, and without seeing him, dropped it on him so that he died, though he was not his enemy and did not seek his harm, then the congregation shall judge between the manslayer and the avenger of blood in accordance with these rules. And the congregation shall rescue the manslayer from the hand of the avenger of blood, and the congregation shall restore him to his city of refuge to which he has fled, and he shall live in it until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. Hmm. But if the manslayer shall at any time go beyond the boundaries of his city of refuge to which he fled, and the avenger of blood finds him outside the boundaries of his city of refuge, and the avenger of blood kills the manslayer, he shall not be guilty of blood." For he must remain in his city of refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the manslayer may return to the land of his possession. And these things shall be for a statute and rule for you throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. If anyone kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death on the evidence of witnesses. But no person shall be put to death on the testimony of one witness. That's yeah. why we have two witnesses uh -huh. in the book of Revelation. Moreover, you shall accept no ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall be put to death. <laughs> you can't buy your way out of this mm -hmm. one. And you shall accept no ransom for him who has fled to his city of refuge that he may return to dwell in the land before the death of the high priest. No, no, you got to wait until the high priest. You, yeah, can't buy your way out of this. You shall not pollute the land in which you live for blood pollutes the land. And no atonement can be made for the land for the blood that is shed on it, except by the blood of the one who shed it. You sh Interesting. Yeah. You shall not defile the land in which you live, in the midst of which I dwell, for I, Yahweh, dwell in the midst of the people of Israel. We're going to finish the book of Deuteronomy today. What? I mean, book of New Numbers today. Well, that's that unusual. Would, yeah, that would be, that would involve definitely compressed time. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, the if book anybody of can do it, we can give it a try. <laughs> Josh built us this time machine. He says it works. It hasn't been tested, he but it's probably fine. He assures us that it works. It's probably yeah, fine. Yeah, it looks kind of scary. It, it's got teeth. Looks looks like an outhouse. <laughs> 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 it's out in the backyard. <laughs> Oh, Sharon and Derek's excellent adventure. Only if Josh is going with us. Numbers, chapter 35. 36. Sorry, 36. Is it 36? Yeah. Yep. Now I have to go back to this. For some reason, I was... Why was I in that? And you get more names. Oh, Okay. Chapter 36, the heads of the father's houses of the clan of the people of Gilead, the son of Machir, son of Manasseh, from the clans of the people of Joseph, came near and spoke before Moses and before the chiefs, the heads of the father's houses of the people of Israel. They said, Yahweh commanded my Lord to give the land for inheritance by lot to the people of Israel. And my Lord was commanded by Yahweh to give the inheritance of Zelophehad, our brother, to his daughters. But if they are married to any of the sons of the other tribes of the people of Israel, then their inheritance will be taken from the inheritance of our fathers and added to the inheritance of the tribe into which they marry. Mm. So it will be taken away from the lot of our inheritance. And when the jubilee of the people of Israel comes, then their inheritance will be added to the inheritance of the tribe into which they marry. And their inheritance will be taken from the inheritance of the tribe of our fathers. And Moses commanded that they've got a point. Mm -hmm. And Moses commanded the people of Israel, according to the word of Yahweh, saying, the tribe of the people of Joseph is right. This is what Yahweh commands concerning the daughters of Zelophehad. Let them marry whom they think best. Only they shall marry within the clan of the tribe of their father. Ah. So find a relative. The inheritance of the people of Israel shall not be transferred from one tribe to another. You can't consolidate territory by marriage. Mm-hmm. Okay, boys, go marry girls from other tribes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
For every one of the people of Israel shall hold on to the inheritance of the tribe of his fathers. And every daughter who possesses an inheritance in any tribe of the people of Israel shall be wife to one of the clan of the tribe of her fathers, so that every one of the people of Israel may possess the inheritance of his or her Mm -hmm. fathers. So this applies if if a daughter inherits Mm -hmm. because she's got no brothers. Right. Then she's being commanded to marry within the tribe. Marry a second cousin or something. Yeah. Because there are laws about whom you may marry. Remember that? Mm -hmm. But if she's not an inheritor, then she can marry whoever she wants. Right. Any one of the 12. Okay. Well, assuming so, yeah. Yeah. So no inheritance shall be transferred from one tribe to another for each of the tribes of the people of Israel shall hold on. To its own inheritance. Verse 10. The daughters of Zelophehad did as Yahweh commanded Moses for Malah, Tirzah, Hogla, Bilka, and Noah. Mm. That's mm-hmm. a, a girl's name in this case. The daughters of Zelophehad were married to sons of their father's brothers. Yeah, cousins. Yes. They were married into the clans of the people of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, and their inheritance remained in the tribe of their father's clan. These are the commandments and the rules that Yahweh commanded through Moses to the people of Israel in the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho. And here's the thing to think about. You've got a couple of million people and all of their animals just across from Jericho. Mm Mm-hmm. Their um, reputation has preceded them. Yeah. Now, we've seen that Why didn't Jericho attack them? Well, numerical disadvantage. Well, yeah, but you have to think, Jericho is sitting there quaking in their little boots, in their sandals. Right. So, is it possible that they were petitioning their God like crazy? Uh, I have no doubt. And probably also calling on other Amorite kingdoms in the area Mm -hmm. and yet they didn't come to help until the israelites crossed the river isn't that interesting that is that river's not that wide no i would i'm gonna have to look this up because there there's obviously been a lot of archaeology done around that area at uh, jericho and a lot of arguments that have stemmed from that because of the chronology of the uh, egyptian history and the assumption that it was Ramses the Great who was the pharaoh of the Exodus, which is incorrect. Right. So the Exodus was placed in the 13th century BC instead of the 15th. And when scholars then dug at, uh, see, Kathleen Kenyon was the main archaeologist back in the 50s who excavated at Jericho. They found the destruction layer, what they thought was in the wrong time, but that was because they had the wrong chronology Mm -hmm. for Egypt. They were taking the wrong time. Yes. So uh, this is where the films by Timothy Mahoney have been so excellent and so helpful. Yes. And the work of Egyptologist uh, David Roll in recalibrating the the time frame of uh, ancient Egypt. Yeah, now David Roll comes at this from a secular viewpoint. Right, yeah. He he does believe that the Bible is more archaeologically correct, historically Mm -hmm. correct, than most skeptical viewers, uh, uh, scholars, that is. And I've, I've interviewed David... And I've read a number of his books, and I his work was really eye-opening. He's right about a lot of things. I, I don't think we need to recalibrate the entire history of Egypt as radically as he suggests. Uh, I think that the work of other scholars like Douglas Petrovich, Bryant Wood, Christian scholars, mm-hmm. are correct. Uh, Scott Stripling also agrees that the Pharaoh of the Exodus was most likely Amenhotep II. Mm-hmm. That would mean Thutmose III, who was a very famous... Uh, military leader for Egypt. They they refer to him as the Napoleon of Egypt, ancient Egypt, fought a battle at Megiddo against a coalition of Canaanite uh, city-states, was the pharaoh of uh, Moses, who raised Moses, the pharaoh from whom Moses fled. Mm -hmm. And interesting, you know, you've got Thutmose and you had other pharaohs in that time frame who were Kamos and Amos, and you've got Moses. That's that's an Egyptian name, by the way. I just want to clarify, when you say he fled, that that was when he was age 40 and he fled right. to Midian. Right. And um, so that would have been what, like 1486 BC and mm-hmm. 1446 is when he came back and led the Exodus. And mm-hmm. 1406 was when the uh, when Joshua led the attack into Canaan. So this had been going on for a while and people talk. You had a lot of merchants who would trade back and forth 
uh, between Egypt and Canaan, there were a, a lot of uh, there, there were still a lot of uh, Amorites living in the Nile Delta. And, and so, you know, these people knew what was going on back yeah, and forth. They did. People talk. It's what you do. It's like the old guys who get together at the Casey's General Store <laughs> and share coffee and stories. Well, there was no CNN morning. at the time. You right. know, no, yeah. no Internet. So that was their source of news merchants, when the merchants would come into town. And many of them were actually intelligence assets for the various kings. They yes, would report they to were. the king. Yeah. So th- they knew stuff was going on. But yet you're right. From Jericho, when we look down from Mount Nebo, you can see Jericho. You can see the plains of Moab. You know, 400 years earlier, before Sodom had been destroyed, it was on a hill overlooking that same plain. Mm-hmm. Uh, strategically, very important locations. Jericho was clearly from their city walls, able to look across the Jordan River and see, wow, there's a lot of people over there. Um, hadn't been anybody living there in 400 years, not since that old city was destroyed up there yeah. on the hill. But mm-hmm. there, all those people are, you know, kind of hanging out there. Yeah, it makes you wonder what were they doing. The archaeologists who dug at Jericho, I think, have put an estimate on the number of people who were living at Jericho at the uh-huh. time, but I don't think it was more than 10,000, maybe. Here's the other thing. Not only do they see a vast plain filled with people and animals, they also see this tent Yes, that appears to have, by day, a pillar of cloud, and by night, a pillar of fire is over it. That's not natural. Would have been pretty spectacular, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. I was I was off by a factor of maybe five, according to archaeologists. Well, no, okay. I'm looking at pre-pottery Neolithic A. That that's don't, way don't way earlier. Yes, yeah. Way way earlier. Uh, Iron Age is what we're mm-hmm. looking for, right? Um, now I'm going to have to do some digging on this. I'll put this in the notes if I can find it. But what I found interesting is that in the time of Abraham, I mean, because Jericho played such a critical role in the history of Israel, <laughs> the local NBC... Apparently the Avon lady is at the yeah, door. <laughs> the local NBC affiliate is sending us a weather update. The um, The impression we have of Jericho is much... that it was much bigger than it actually was. Um, in the days of Sodom, Sodom being just across the river on a hill overlooking the plains of Moab. Uh, according to the guys who were doing the dig there, there were like 85 acres inside the city walls at Sodom and 240 acres together occupied uh, around the city, outside the city walls, which doesn't sound huge, but it was the biggest city in the Levant. Mm hmm south of the Sea of Galilee. Yeah, if you get a city of 100,000, that's a big city. Yeah. um, They estimate about 40,000 people altogether lived on the plains of Moab, including Sodom. Mm -hmm. So 240 acres occupied, connected directly to the city of Sodom. Across the river at Jericho, 10 acres. (laughs) That's the difference in the time of Abraham. Uh, Jerusalem at the time of Abraham, you know, Melchizedek and all of that, Mm -hmm. 12 acres. Mm -hmm. Sodom, 85 inside the walls on the hill. And then another 240 around the city. So that that's a big, big deal. Um, but yeah, I'd like to see how many people were in Jericho at the time of um, Joshua. Mm-hmm. Well, Joshua didn't go straight over to Jericho. He went down to Og first. Yeah. Yeah, which took a couple of months. I, mm-hmm. I calculated it based on the average travel rate of about five miles a day, which is a scholarly estimate based mm-hmm. on historical, you know, analyses of... of what are they, a tribal uh, of pastoral people mm-hmm. having to move flocks and herds? Uh, soldiers can move ten to fifteen miles a day, but these were not soldiers. A lot of them were, <laughs> yeah, kids, elderly, and then right goats, sheep. Well, no one was over forty, except for Joshua and Caleb. When when they crossed it, over, yeah, yeah. But, uh, well, yeah, there there might still have been some elderly folks who were with them when they crossed all, all the way up to Og. It was that nobody over 40 crossed over the... Uh, over yeah, that's the what chamber. I'm saying at that time. Right, right yeah. yeah. But even so, they you know, died. flocks, goats, you know, goats, sheep, cattle. So anyway, yeah, fascinating stuff. And we will get into Deuteronomy next week and start on the, uh, the actual conquest because the whole... Uh, well, at Deuteronomy 1, we, we start in with a, a uh, description of the, the journey from um, the wilderness to... Uh, 
where they were, were and about to take, cross over the river. Uh, we would get some more details about Og of Bashan and uh, the Rephaim tribes and Sihon of Heshbon. Oh, and all so, of that. so much to talk fascinating about. Fascinating stuff. So much more to talk about this time around than we talked about when we were here before in Deuteronomy. Yeah. Talking about Og. Whew. I was talking with somebody about this um, you know, just the other day and, and how, how slowly we're going through these uh, chapters now compared to five years ago. We started this back in September of 2014. We thought we were going through slowly before. Yeah. But so we're coming up on seven years of this uh, this yeah. weekly, mostly weekly Bible study. We are. And mind you, and there sometimes for a it's while, weekly with W-E-A-K, weekly. <laughs> uh, well, That's me. You know, That's we on do our me. best. There was a time, though, that we were doing two of them a week. Yes. Because we, were, we realized we were going very slowly and we wanted to get to the New Testament. If you're interested in hearing our comments on the New Testament, you can. There's a New Testament archive at gilberthess.org. Right. Yeah. We've got every week when we uh, do a study, it updates the archive page. And you'll find it in the top menu bar. It says archive. And then when you mouse over it, you get New Testament archive, Old Testament archive. And that will uh, show you then all of the... Uh, <laughs> All the studies going back to the very first one, Gilbert House episode one was September. Oh, well, September something of uh, of 2014. Um, Probably it? 11. Oh, it, it was actually. It was September 11th. Oh, my about gosh. That? Yeah. Well, 9-11 of 2014 was our very first study. Yeah, that should be easy to remember. Yeah. But uh, uh, we, you could, again, if you want to hear the New Testament studies, all of those are in there as well. And... Um, Let's see. Oh, yeah. Coming up uh, just a couple of weeks. Yeah. The Revelation Insight and Spiritual Warfare Weekend at uh, the Finley River Ranch that's in Sparta or just outside Sparta, Missouri, which is between Springfield and Branson. It's a beautiful camp. It really beautiful is. Beautiful camp. And, and everything takes place in this gorgeous lodge. Mm hmm. So we will be speaking there Friday evening, Saturday, most of the day. And then on Sunday morning, between 10 and noon, there'll be some worship. And then uh, and then either I or we will will preach on Sunday morning. I don't know. I'm thinking maybe you. Boy, you can you bring it when you preach. <laughs> so, well, waiting for some inspiration on that. But uh, that, God usually, well, he always comes through. He as long always as, comes as through. As long as I get out of the way. But uh, this will be kind of an intimate gathering because the space is somewhat limited. But uh, it, it means that we get to meet more people Face to face, yeah. Then at a conference where you get two or three thousand people, and uh, um, that can be a little difficult sometimes, a little overwhelming. Yeah. So I think the most this holds is maybe a hundred. I think that's right. So if you want to reserve your place, you can find the link at uh, the website gilberthouse.org or go directly to hiscallministries.net. Hiscallministries.net. Um, then the Warriors Conference in San Diego in September, September yes. 16th through 19th. California, here we come. Now, let's just pray that the TSA holds to its current position, that it will drop the mask mandate on airlines as of September 15th. It would be nice to fly without uh, masks on the 16th. I know. We'll see but what happens. We'll see what but, happens. You know, when, when we'll be we there regardless. California, regardless of what the national uh, thing is, it could be the California will have their own. Yeah. Uh, just came back, as I mentioned, from St. Louis, and St. Louis is reimposing a mask mandate effective tomorrow, Monday, uh, July 26th. Yeah, well, the Attorney General of Missouri is uh, going after them, saying, yeah. you can't do that. Yeah, we'll um, see what happens there. That will be interesting, because it may set a precedent for mm. other states to follow suit. Uh, literally, suit. Yeah. Um, what, what else is going on? Well, uh, those are the two main things. Uh, just remember Gilbert uh, Gilbert 20, the promo code Gilbert 20 for Hear the Watchman. Yeah. Because uh, that knocks $20 off the price of tickets. Yes. So Gilbert also, 20. Also want to remind you that the October 2021 trip to Israel has been changed to March of 2022. Right. And uh, we've got a link there also on the right-hand side. You'll find at the website, we've got... Uh, Upcoming studies, just to give you an idea of what chapters we'll be looking at in the upcoming weeks, as long as I remember to change it, because we don't always follow our own schedule. But uh, there's also conferences and tours, and uh, those will have links to more information. And if you're interested in joining us in Israel, where we can point out stuff like this, actually, instead of just telling you what it looks like from Mount Nebo, we can show you while we're on Mount Nebo. Yeah. See, there, there's the Dead Sea, that smudge in the distance, that's Jericho. And this is what Moses saw at and the age of 120. You know, you can watch it in a documentary and you can learn a lot because I love documentaries, but or travel documentaries as we do, <laughs> but uh, blather mentories. 
But uh, um, there's nothing that substitutes for actually being there. No, no. Seeing that that landscape, mm-hmm. feeling that heat and realizing, okay, Moses and the Israelites lived in this for 40 years with no air conditioning. Yeah. And no ice cream stands. No ice cream stands. <laughs> And uh, you're basically walking everywhere. There was no bus to take them up the top of the mountain. He had to walk at the age of 120. Yeah. I wonder what they, they used for tea because, you know, what we consider tea today, mm-hmm. I don't know that that was traded back then, but maybe it was. China may have been raising, raising tea leaves even back then. And, may have been. And we're trading them. Yeah. But I will say the Bedouin tea is really awesome. Yes, it is. Was it cardamom that they put in there? Yes, it is. And it cools you off. That was... Counterintuitive. The big surprise. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's 105 degrees outside. You're giving no, me hot 100, tea. 112. Yeah. It was 112. That was a warm day in Wadi Rum. Yeah. But you're giving us hot tea. Oh, hey, this is actually refreshing. Mm-hmm. How does that work? Well, uh, again, all that information is in the right hand column at gilberthouse.org. Thought I'd broken the website this morning. Glad I didn't. I'm glad you didn't, too. So anyway, (laughs) uh, um, keep everybody in prayer who lives in California or anywhere that they're in the line of fire. Oregon. Literally from those fires. Uh, We've heard from some of you who live very close to the edge of this fire or one of the fires. Um, We we just pray that the Lord puts a hedge of protection around you. Mm, Amen. We do, indeed. Um, There are others who are experiencing floods. In some parts of the world, in fact, China, which was just flooded, is now going to be flooded again by a typhoon that's coming through. Oh, my. Um, So it's it's very, very difficult. And some of these floods are uh, compromising the the soil beneath buildings, Mm -hmm. just like happened in Florida. It just suddenly you'll get almost like liquefaction beneath a building and it just crumbles. So uh, I think this is actually happening worldwide. You're seeing more and more sinkholes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's tragic. And, and I know that some of you, you're not involved in a flood, you're not involved in, in, in a big forest fire, but you're going through some very difficult times. And we want you to know that no matter what you're going through, the Lord is right there beside you. You may not feel Him, You may not sense him, but you have to really believe he is there because he is. You are never alone. When Jesus said, I will always be with you, I will never leave you alone, he meant it. Mm -hmm. Do you really think he lied? Because we we sometimes base reality upon our perception. Well, I don't feel it, so it's not there. Exactly. A lot of churches today, that's why they rely on... Music that evokes a certain mood mm-hmm. and people will seek that out. There's nothing wrong with music that takes you to a, a place of worshipful reverence to God. Mm-hmm. But we we don't, we cannot feel that way all the time. The enemy will play on our emotions. And if we mistakenly believe that we can tell the presence of God or the favor of God by how we feel on any given day... We're going to be in in real trouble because there are times we will feel just awful, like the world is is closing in on us, um, like we're carrying the weight of the world on our shoulders. And um, I, I think I know what you're referring to. Just well, not just that, but but I've I've heard from a lot of people who yes. are going for through from terrible times. Right, right. They've got loved ones in the hospital, and, and it just seems like they've been in there for months. Um, someone that you love who's suddenly ill, and you may risk losing him or her. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody has something. Yeah. But some of you are going through extreme circumstances. The, the Old Testament is filled with examples of individuals who were under major right. duress, yeah. but not once did the Lord abandon them. Right. If, they, if they chose to ask him for help, he was always there in yeah. the Old Testament. In the New Testament age, with the new covenant in blood, if you are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ and you have the Holy Spirit, which marks you out as belonging to him— he is always there. And the testing is, is being allowed for 
a reason. Mm -hmm. There are times when we wish God didn't have so much faith in us to allow us to go through such intense testing, trials, uh, refining. Mm -hmm. You know that shield is actually the shield of faith. Mm -hmm. If we lower that shield and the enemy's arrows begin piercing the... uh, and it's not a magical us. working. Yeah, no, no, yeah, no. At all. Right. But but, uh, but again, the point is that, that God doesn't change. No. And, he, and our, uh, it, it, the historical truth of the resurrection is not affected by our mood in any given day. And, no. But the enemy will, will often convince us of that. And like I said, there are some churches today who equate that that feeling of spirituality and holiness that is evoked by certain mm-hmm. styles of music with the presence of God and the favor of God. But when that feeling goes away, it doesn't mean that God has left you. It just means you're not hearing that song anymore, or those that music anymore. God is still there with you. His faithfulness, his loyalty to you does not change depending on your mood. I mean, you, you, like and you point his, out in the Old Testament, yes. you look at prophets like Jeremiah was called the weeping mm-hmm. prophet for mm-hmm. a reason. Elijah basically said to God, kill me now mm-hmm. because they're chasing after me and I'm the last one left. There's no reason for me to live. And we have to remember we are on a battlefield. Yeah. The enemy yeah. is trying to get at you every way he can. Mm-hmm. And the Lord provides protection. Remember, you're in his hand. Anything that the enemy is allowed to do, any penetration of that hand, the Lord has opened his fingers for a reason. Mm -hmm. He's trying to make you stronger. He trusts you. Yeah. And and it may be that the whole purpose is to give you insight into others who are enduring what you are going through, but don't have any anchor, don't have anything to with which to to anchor their their lives mm-hmm. you have christ many don't and so they have no reason not to do that next self-destructive thing or to engage in self-destructive behaviors to try to numb the pain and those that's the, the snowball begins rolling downhill it and does. doesn't lead to a good end i have watched through social media i've watched quite a number of individuals who are going through extreme circumstances. And often it involves some sort of medical issue. Yeah. And you can, you can tell by the posts that these people put up there that their witness is so strong and everybody who's in that hospital or in the the clinics, these People are seeing the love of Christ and this, the, the, the type of Ephesians 6 warfare um, uh, weaponry that the Lord gives us. And they have to be marveling at this. This is a chance to, to witness to the world simply through your reaction to distress. That's something that the enemy doesn't want the public to realize, doesn't want people to know. I mean, the, the idea has been growing in our civilization, our culture, and especially in the West, Europe and, and North America for the last couple of decades, that there is no good that comes from suffering and that death is an acceptable remedy for suffering. If you're well, po- in fact, they'll say in some circumstances, you know, if you're feeling kind of blue. That's my point. Yeah. Yeah. If you're depressed, yeah, just, you know. Here, here's a a, a, a here's cocktail, some, and here's yeah. here's yeah mm-hmm. here's here's a cocktail that a doctor can inject, and you know this this uh, this right to death movement is is based on that premise that if your quality of life is not what it should be, or not what a medical doctor or psych you know psychiatrist psychologist decides that it mm-hmm. should be, then uh, death is an acceptable alternative. But there is a dignity in in suffering. There can be a dignity in suffering. Uh, and perhaps that is, I mean, there are those who would say, what, what, what good came of Paul being thrown in prison? Well, he was witnessing to his jailers, mm-hmm. some of whom were members of the household of the emperor. Mm-hmm. Paul, and when he, exactly. I mean, Paul went to Rome. He appealed his case before Felix, Felix, right. So that he would have an opportunity to bring his case to the emperor. It's like, okay, I might wind up getting killed for this, but Hey, at the same time, I may be able to share the gospel with Tiberius. Yeah. Or near I, I'll have to look up who the emperor was at the time, but Tiberius or Nero. But think about that. 
Paul wasn't looking at this as like, oh, I'm going to be stuck in a Roman prison, which is not a good place to be. It's like, no, hey, if I do this, I may share the gospel with the emperor of Rome. What a witness that would be. It doesn't mean that the, he didn't have days where he was very depressed. And you can read that in his or letters. Or even angry. You can, you can read that mm-hmm. in his letters. You say, Please, hey, you know, send, come visit me as soon as you can. Yeah. You're reading between the lines. You can mm-hmm. see Paul had his human days. He was not, you know, he, he was subject to the same emotions and pressures as the rest of us. Yes. So that, that may be why you're on the path you're on. God will... Make it clear to you. And that's why we, we, in our prayers, we always ask for wisdom because there are things that foolish things I do yeah. based on my natural responses to things going on around me. And, and that, let me just say this too. Um, that I would like to grow out of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one day we'll have new bodies and perhaps we'll, we'll be better about these things. Mm-hmm. Um, Gilbert House Fellowship has... A Facebook page. Um, I, I pray that the Lord allows us to remain, keep these accounts for as long as possible. But the Facebook page is there for you. It's more than just um, we will post here's what's going on with Gilbert House. Mm-hmm. And yes, we do use it for that a lot. But if you want to communicate with other people who listen to Gilbert House Fellowship, there is an opportunity there for you to do that. Yeah, I will, uh, looking at the, the uh, uh, our website, I see I don't have a link to our Facebook page of the website, which is kind of silly. So I will, I will correct that after this study, so there will be a link directly to the, uh, the Facebook page. But uh, yeah, opportunity perhaps to fellowship, maybe find people in your area to connect with. Yeah, I mean, because reason, I know many of you don't have church homes. That's why we started this this. This this study, this podcast seven years ago, it was your suggestion based on people who were coming up to us at conferences and saying, can you recommend a church? Because I don't mm-hmm. have one in my area that's actually teaching from the Bible. Not that we're the, the best no, we're teachers not. of the Bible out there. I mean, there are so many scholars who are so much better at this than we are, but uh, hopefully we can show that just by going through the Bible and reading it out loud. Now, let's talk... I remember I was talking with a friend of mine yesterday, um, had the opportunity to stop and uh, have lunch with a fellow that I worked with when we were both doing Top 40 Radio in St. Louis back in 1990. I hired him out of Albuquerque and um, he came up to St. Louis. Didn't find out until just a few months ago when we reconnected because we'd lost track of each other after I got fired from that radio station in 1990. Uh, He got fired not long after that uh, because they brought in a new team and uh, so they cleaned out the old crew. But he went on to have a very successful career in in broadcasting. Um, I more or less hung on long enough to realize it wasn't where I was supposed to be and got out. But I didn't realize I'd introduced him to his wife. When he, oh. first, he, first, he came to town on New Year's Eve of 1989, and we were having some big event at some club in St. Louis, and uh, she was the events coordinator for this club. They met and uh, then reconnected, and they've been married for 30 years. Uh, but we were talking about the Bible, and he said that uh, he has trouble reading the Bible because he's really creative, really intelligent, but a little... Um, one of those kids whose mind is kids. He's two years younger than me, whose mind is going, you know, a dozen different right. places. So reading his, his mind wanders. I said, do what we do. Just sit down with Terry and, and just you two just start reading the Bible out loud to each other. Yeah. You'll, you'll be amazed how that, that forces you to focus. And then you start noticing stuff that you would have skipped over if you were just reading it yourself. Oh yeah. That's why we do it this way. And we encourage you to do this with your family, especially with your children. Get them interested, get them excited, especially when you get to the parts where you start talking about the gods and the giants. Mm-hmm. And especially when you get into Job and he starts describing the dragon. I mean, that's like, oh, the, for, I know. for I a know. 10-year-old boy, that'd be like the high point of the Bible right there. I know. But then as they age and they realize, okay, that's part of the story. Yeah, that's just the, the where it's describing the enemy. Now let's talk about the hero. Yeah. And that's why we have to go to this big finish here in Revelation. Yeah. Yeah. So, Amen. Well. Well, there you go. A long, <laughs> blathery episode. <laughs> Father, thank you for bringing us together over your word. We, we are grateful for your spirit, which 
not only instructs us and and guides us, but fills us, makes us, makes it possible for us to forgive and to love. We thank you for your word, for preserving your word for us miraculously through these centuries, through the, through the millennia, that three more than 3,000 years later, we can read what Moses and the Israelites endured, what they experienced as they prepared to fulfill your promise or inherit your promise that you would fulfill for and and like all of us they did so imperfectly as we will read in the weeks ahead and yet lord through these flawed imperfect humans making mistakes reacting impulsively trying to fulfill your promise themselves rather than waiting on you your will was fulfilled anyway in spite of those through whom you act. So, Lord, may you take us, imperfect, in some cases broken. Bind us together, Lord. Make us whole, that we may be useful vessels in your service. We pray for those who are hurting, those who have been wronged, abandoned, those who are struggling financially, especially as we go through this uh, long response to this virus, who found their livelihoods suddenly cut off, who may have found that uh, those who they counted as friends weren't nearly as close as they, they had thought. We pray for your spirit to grant, just give us encouragement, Lord, knowing that you, as the creator of the universe, knowing all of our flaws from the beginning, willingly gave yourself as a sacrifice to redeem us anyway. Help us to appreciate that, Lord. Just the the unimaginable love that it would take. to forgive us of all that we have done and yet will do, Father, as we fail you each day. Help us, Lord, each day to follow your steps more closely, knowing that we can never earn our way into your kingdom, but that you have purchased our entry into that kingdom with your blood. Help us to understand, Father, that we are in the midst of of an epic journey and that we have a role to play small though it may be that we will share in that glory of the kingdom that is to come we pray for the broken and the hurting father that your spirit would bless us all And we pray for your soon return, Lord. Come quickly. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Until next time, I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We post a new Bible study each Sunday morning. Subscribe to the podcast and explore the archives online at gilberthouse.org.